evening. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the second of our CPD sessions in English, and I'm particularly excited about this one. I'm excited about all of them, but as a former English teacher, this is always my absolute favourite. I am absolutely delighted to welcome back Flora Bonner-McKenzie of St Hugh's School. She's also an English team leader and setter She's absolutely the expert. Her energy is infectious. Her understanding of English and how to teach children with enthusiasm and a range of wonderful ideas is outstanding. The aim of these sessions is to support you to deliver the second year of teaching the new English specifications for CE. And in this session, Flora is going to focus on the reading certificate and also the impact of wider reading across the CE 13 plus English curriculum. What I know Flora is really passionate about is the way in which English as a subject can help embed good practice in all subjects. This webinar comes as a sequel to our previous Twilight CPD session on English in March, in which we discussed integrating EDI, encouraging creativity in the new English CE specification. I'm certain you're going to enjoy this session with Flora. And let me just remind you to find us on social media at ISCB Awards on all channels. Now, once this session's finished, there will be time for questions. Please, as before, use the chat function in YouTube. Now, if you can't see it, it's because you need to be logged in. Either log into YouTube or Google. If you're finding that you, you don't have a login, you might need to create um, an account in order to do it. But what's going to happen is Sophie's backstage ready to collate all of your questions. And Flora and I will have a chat at the end where we can explore everything that you've got to ask. So without much further ado, let me hand you over to Flora. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really lovely to be back again. Thank you, Julia, for probably overselling me a little bit in the introduction there. Um, but yes, as Julia said, I've been um, the team leader for English with ICB just uh, over this last academic year. Um, I teach year six, seven and eight English at uh, St Hugh's Prep School in Lincolnshire. Um, and as of September, I will also be head of uh, our senior school, so actually is six to eight. So um, we'll have quite a lot to do with um, exam setting and ISEB uh, for all of our subjects as well as just English. So, um, yeah, it's lovely to uh, to be back. And um, and as Julia said, I think this session is particularly one that I'm excited to deliver um, about the reading certificate. We've already had a few questions. Um, come in, which I'll kind of get to at the end, but it's been, um, you know, definitely one of those areas of the new specification that's got a lot of teachers talking, I think, about how to best um, integrate our kind of wider reading into everything else that you do to prepare for the exams. Um, so if I could have the first slide, please, we'll get going. Um, so uh, the aims of this session um, are kind of broadly to uh, sort of go over really what's mentioned about the reading certificate in the actual specification. So I'll kind of break down um, and just remind you of, of how um, the specification introduces the reading certificate, because obviously it is a new element of the specification from um, the September 2021. Um, the uh, sort of focus of the session, really the main focus as a strategy for engaging pupils with the reading certificate is going to be something called literature circles, which I briefly alluded to in my last um, CPD session. And some of you may have heard of, but I'll go into a bit of more detail about how those might work. And then also looking ahead at how the reading certificate may evolve in the future. And that's kind of going to tie in, I hope, quite nicely with a couple of the questions that we've had as well. So um, in terms of what's in the specification, um, so all of the, these next couple of slides are kind of taken word for word, really, from, uh, from the specification, just to refresh what's in there as the purpose behind the reading certificate. So that pupils are exposed to wide, adventurous and sustained reading. I think the sustained really spoke to me there, um, as, you know, I'm sure I'm not alone in being an English teacher that sees a bit of a drop off. Um, as the children go into year seven, um, other things, pulling them in lots of different directions. And um, so sustaining that enjoyment and excitement about reading through years seven and eight, um, when they've got so many other things that are kind of heaped on them over those two years, 
uh, I think is going to be um, a really important element of the reading certificate. Uh, the range of cultures, periods, forms. So um, thinking about prose fiction, but not neglecting those other important forms of, um, of writing. So the nonfiction, poetry and drama. Uh, learning through collaboration, I think lends itself really well to the reading certificate, um, at which I'm gonna talk about a bit more later on. Um, and the oral and written articulation of responses to literature. So again, I just wanted to draw attention there to the oral nature um, of some of the work that you can do with pupils uh, wider reading. And again, the literature circles kind of lend themselves really well to that collaboration, that discussion, rather than the pupils feeling like to prove that they've read a book or that their only option is to write more stuff down. And um, so we'll come on to that a bit more later on. Um, so just a reminder as well that it's still very much um, kind of filters through the specification and through uh, the last CPD session I did um, and certainly any future ones that I will do that really the best way of teaching those reading skills um, in, you know, towards uh, taking the CE examinations is through the study of whole class texts, but that the reading certificate is designed to support the wider reading alongside those whole class texts and that can actually be a kind of really helpful starting point for your um, uh, book lists, book suggestions for your pupils is actually to encourage them and um, to perhaps look at the headings of the reading certificate as being a springboard sort of from a studied whole class text into uh, wider reading as well. Um, so just a few more little quotes I pulled out of the specification and um, I thought it was just worth um, sort of refreshing our memory of um, so that the reading certificate is de designed to encourage good habits of wider reading um, as well as extend pupils experience of different genres um, to complement and enrich their habitual reading and to be a, um, a celebration of achievement in wider reading that can be shared with their senior schools. And I think it's really important to emphasize here that the reading certificate, I don't think should feel like an add-on. It shouldn't feel like something you're having to force into um, an otherwise, uh, an already very, you know, busy <laughs> curriculum, not just for English, but for many, many of their subjects. Um, it should be an opportunity for you as a teacher or as a head of English to celebrate what those pupils are already doing, you know, to recognise um, that they are habitually reading and they are challenging themselves to experience a wide range of different genres. Um, so this is the um, is in the specification as an appendix is the format at the, as it stands at the moment for recording your pupil's um, completion of the reading certificate. Now, as it stands at the moment, I think the way, certainly the way that I'm approaching this this year with my first cohort through is that I have a sort of printed uh, version of this um, and I sort of keep a few notes as, as they go, um, just for my own memory really, <laughs> to have um, a, you know, a note of what they've read. Um, they all have a copy of this as well in their English folders so that they can just kind of keep a little log of anything that they've read that would fit into um, a category from their reading certificate. What I tended to find so far with these um, headings across the top is that actually a lot of this, um, a lot of these genres, they are reading or have an interest in reading already. So whilst for some of them, um, it's really going to be a push to get them to read um, a non-fiction book discussing a contemporary or historical issue, or for some of them, it's going to be a real push to get them to read a fantasy novel when they're not really into that kind of thing. But generally speaking, I think the headings are broad enough that they kind of cover a lot of the texts that our children are likely to be interested in anyway. Um, they also lend themselves really well to, um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that's springboarding from a text that you're studying in the classroom 
um, to then broaden out to other things. So, for example, um, my year six children read um, High Rise Mystery by Shana Jackson. And they do a little bit of Sherlock Holmes as well. They absolutely get so into the detective genre, detective novel genre, that that's kind of, um, you know, a great springboard then for, to, for me to suggest other stories that they might enjoy with that same sort of um, sort of approach and same sort of conventions. So kind of if we're doing any of these within the classroom that I think could be a great springboard for them to those um, other texts, then that's the time to bring it up is when they're really engaged in that genre already and really loving um, a text that you've chosen to read as a class because they're far more likely then, um, I think, to go and seek out those other things that fit within the same genre. Um, so I just included this uh, slide really as um, I just thought it was interesting in terms of, again, reading not and certainly the completion of the reading certificate, not feeling like an add-on. Um, so this came from the National Literacy Trust uh, survey that they do every year, kind of looking at um, trends and patterns in young people's reading. And um, I thought it was just interesting to note the kind of top three um, in terms of the reasons for reading, because these are all things that I think we can quite easily build into um, the cl our classrooms, our libraries, but also kind of use as reasons for our own pupils to read. So helping me relax. I'm very lucky, actually, that I've got a lovely little relaxing corner of my classroom um, that's, you know, surrounded by bookshelves and um, has a little sofa and a sort of coffee table. Um, but the sort of building in that time to, to read in a relaxed sort of way um, definitely really helps the enthusiasm. Um, and I think those, these other top two, the new things and the new words, I think, um, again, that pupils, uh, if they're really interested in a topic, I know I'm, you know, preaching to the choir here, like we know how it works. If a pupil is interested in a topic, they're, of course, much more likely to go and seek out reading material that's related to that topic. And I think the inclusion of um, a couple of the sort of more non-fiction genres um, in the reading certificate will really help those pupils that see reading actually as being quite a, um, a practical skill, you know, to learn about a topic that they're interested in. But the fact that they can read a non-fiction book, they can read an autobiography, they do have, um, you know, free choice of another text that actually um, what might really support those pupils that prefer to read in sort of a very um, transactional, uh, practical sort of way. Um, so now I come on to the literature circles and the, um, the sort of strategy I've used uh, for a couple of years now to engage the pupils in wider reading. I just wanted in this first slide to draw attention to the fact that this is not my idea. <laughs> um, and it's been around for quite a while, um, as you can probably tell by the covers of these books that look rather dated. Um, but they are both great. If, if what I um, kind of talk about today really resonates with you and it's something that you'd like to try in your own classrooms and haven't done before, um, these both of these books are really good starting points, particularly the mini lessons um one on um on the right hand side which has uh you know actual lesson plans within it of things that you can do um to build in reading skills but in sort of bite-sized chunks for your pupils so even if you don't end up doing the literature circles um full on to start with some of those mini lessons um might be really helpful ways of just introducing different types of text and different um different reading material to your pupils So the basic principle of uh, the literature circles is first and foremost that the pupils choose their own texts. Um, now, I say that with a slight um, pinch of salt because it is their own text from a choice. So obviously, if I just gave them access to the library or access to my bookshelves up in my classroom and said, right, choose anything and that's going to be your literature circle book. 
Um, the issue that I'd have then is that I couldn't form any groups because they may all choose something completely different. So I usually give them, um, so say with my year sevens currently of a class of 12, and I might have put out, I think, around five or six different books um, in the knowledge that they're going to read more than they could ever um, kind of read. You know, they're going to read more extracts and things than they ever could uh, in one go. But uh, it gives them a range of genres to choose from, a range of types to choose from, and, and pretty much guarantees that everybody's going to find something they're interested in. Um, their pupils are then grouped based on their choice of text. So it's nothing to do with their ability. It's nothing to do with their um, with sets they might be in or anything like that. It is um, based purely on the text that they have chosen. And I really try as much as possible to honor their choices if they, you know, and to give everybody sort of their, their first choice or second choice if I can, because um, nothing is gonna motivate them more ultimately than they, um, the fact that they, they're the ones that have chosen that book. So um, that's really important. Um, once they're into their groups, having chosen um, uh, their books, they then create their own reading schedule. So if I say uh, I tend to run a literature circle sort of cycle um, over a half term. So let's say it's five or six weeks and they sit down with a blank calendar and they create their own schedule. I'll show you a bit more about that um, later on. Um, questions and discussion around that book then comes from the pupils rather than from me. Um, the teacher does not lead any particular group. So, of course, there may be groups that need a bit more facilitating than others. But the idea is that you are not um, you or if you've got TAs in your classroom, you're not sitting with individual groups for a whole lesson leading them. Um, but you are very much giving them them giving them the tools to lead themselves um, and lead their group discussion themselves. And the personal responses and connections between the text and the world around them, they are really the starting point for discussion. So as well as kind of practicing all those literacy skills, they are first and foremost developing and practicing enjoying responding to a text, you know, by, by looking at it in how they relate to that text and how that text relates to their world. And um, so it's much more about the kind of personal response. Um, so, as far as, so the first thing I mentioned, obviously, was that pupils choose their own books. So this is what I've used um, in the past. Uh, it's a sort of book review sheet, basically. So they sit, come in, they sit down at a table, maybe with a group of three or four. They've got five or six books stacked up on the table. Um, and I essentially give them two minutes a book. So I set a timer for two minutes. They pick any of the books off, um, off their pile that they want to dip into. They make a note of the title and they basically just start reading and they read as much as they can within a couple of minutes. Those pupils that um, are slower readers, I will tend to ask to focus on the front cover, the back cover, the blurb, and perhaps even to pick a page uh, somewhere in the middle um, uh, in terms of difficulty, particularly, I think this is quite an important one for your weaker readers. Get them to pick a page somewhere in the middle um, and actually to kind of count um, how many mistakes they're making or words they come across they're not sure of, because um, that will give them a good indication as to whether the book is the appropriate level of difficulty for them. Um, but basically, then once that two minutes is up, they um, they kind of very quickly review the book so there's um it's a bit blurry i'm afraid on the photo but there's basically an interest rating from uh one to five so like they felt really meh didn't really like it being one and they were really interested in it uh being five and there's also then a difficulty rating so really easy being a one really difficult be uh, like too hard almost being um a five so you can see you can probably see just about the text choice some of the text choices they had uh this time round um, 
yeah, I'm not too worried about them writing down the right title. Uh, as you can see, um, one of them's very diligently written out the entire title of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Uh, the other one's just gone for The Dog. Um, I had some dead dog as well uh, because of the cover. So but as long as they know what they mean and I know what they mean, that's absolutely not a problem. Um, interesting that, um, in fact, one of the uh, boys on these, this sheet had even noted about the curious incident, you know, the murder mystery. So straight away, that was he identified that as being something that was a bit more of interest to him. Um, as a, So his interest rating was quite high on that one because he knew straight away um, you know, I like murder mystery stories. It's, it sounds like it's going to be one of those. Um, and then they pick from that, they do their um, their top three. I would say as well that um, there's very, very little that can go wrong with this activity. And if you've not done one before, even for pupils just to find their next reading book, to just get a load out in the library and just let them have two minutes each, um, the pressure of the time actually just kind of gets them focused. Um, there's very few, um, very little resistance to it that I've ever experienced. They're just excited to have the, the choice and the options and dip into a few different things. Um, and I would say as well, those two minutes when they are reading are silent. You know, I've never, um, it, very, very rarely do I have um, pupils that kind of push it because they also recognise that actually that will spoil it for everybody else and everybody else wants to really concentrate on trying to read as much as possible to get um, get an idea of what they're interested in. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a great way to start and it kind of gets them um, perhaps even lining up what their next book might be after the one that they eventually choose as well. Um, so the next thing uh, once they're in their groups and this is really really important and it's probably the part of the literature circles that my pupils loved the most um, is when they first get into their groups and um, each time they meet as a group so you can see mine managed one two three four five meetings we did have a sixth one as well um, in sort of as they were finishing off the books um, but each time they meet, I ask them to just do a kind of conversation warm up. So they choose a question, doesn't have to be anything to do with English. Um, so they've chosen this group, they went for like favourite and least favourite sports. Uh, what positions of responsibility do they want to apply for when they're in year eight? Um, or what they chose as their book illustration, what their favourite book was and why. And why do we need to read? I think was that so they're quite book related actually this this group. But some of them, you know, they don't have to be at all. Um, and some of them really enjoyed coming up with like a list of possible topics we could discuss at the start of each lesson. So I just give them ten minutes um, to go around discuss answers to the questions. So some of them was what favorite film, TV show you're binge watching at the moment, whatever it was. But it gives them time to just practice talking um, and I think we so um, so often fall into the trap of thinking well if they're having a discussion then it has to be about the book that we're reading or the the text that we do but actually they just need to they just need to practice the skill and um, I think the topic um, is largely irrelevant for some for a 10 minute task um, and they really enjoyed it it meant they got to know each other a little better because even though they spend a lot of time together um, how often they actually sit down and discuss some of these things uh, is, is questionable. Um, but it also just got them focused for the session. Um, so they were kind of in the right frame of mind. They were talking to each other. They were listening to the responses. Um, they were having to make some notes. Uh, so this is, was also great practice for some just really straightforward, um, quick note taking as well. Um, which becomes then really valuable when they're having discussions about their actual book. Um, so definitely uh, worth making time for something like this um, when the book groups meet, uh, because it just fosters a much more um, sort of reciprocal uh, relationship between them. Um, so this is an example of a uh, schedule that I've given to pupils. So um, 
obviously this is not a pupil one unfortunately i couldn't find any of my pupil ones so they must have all run off with them and had them presumably diligently taped up in their bedroom or something so they remembered uh what to do basically i give them a blank calendar and they have to decide where they will read up to by each time they meet so um, quite often I will have already entered into the calendar the actual lessons that I'm going to give them for their meetings so it's usually um, once a fortnight that I try and get in for them to have a meeting and um, I did actually with the current year sevens is the first time they've done it this uh, last term so they did one um, every week uh, for just half of the lesson so half an hour every week they knew they'd be able to meet up to discuss what they'd read over that week um and so they just they have the books in front of them in their first meeting they have to come up with a schedule where they have completed it by whatever date i've given them so if the date they have to complete it with a six weeks time they need to go through the book they split it up and they say right so by the end of week one I, we all need to be at this page by the end of week two we all need to be at this page um it is unbelievable what a difference that makes to their motivation if they have decided when they are getting to a certain page by um by and large they are far far more likely to get the reading done um and it's a transformation that i co couldn't honestly quite believe of some of my particularly my more reluctant boys um but if they had sat down and decided right by next week we will have read up to page 70. If I'd set them that, there would have been immediate resistance. Oh, miss, no, that's not long enough. Uh, when am I ever going to have the time? If they've set it themselves, for some reason, they just do it. Um, and I think that comes with it as well, you know, that sense of responsibility towards the group, um, they take really seriously. So uh, yeah, it, they, they all had um, ad asked for post-its so they could put a post-it in their books where they are now, a little, another little post-it later on, right, I need to get to here by this date. Um, and suddenly, as soon as you give the responsibility to them, um, it just becomes so much easier to, uh, to sort of, to feel confident, I suppose, that they're actually going to get the reading done by the time they've said they'll get it done. Um, and then ultimately what happens um, is they they do it, they get on with it. So the idea is, of course, that it's helping them to foster and develop independence when approaching a text. It does not happen overnight. Um, they do need a lot of prompting, particularly in the first few sessions. So they might brainstorm as a group some questions that they might ask each other, for example, um right next time we meet we've read up to page 50. so what questions when we meet next time could we ask each other about pages 1 to 50 and they come up with a list and in the early stages we tend to do that quite collaboratively so i'll give them a few minutes in their group to discuss it then feedback and we'll get like a big list on the board that they can then use in their next session when they're discussing those pages um i've also i would really recommend making sort of little remind like a, a little bookmark or a little reminder um, for them to keep in their book um, to of things like how to make a little note or how to um, jot down something on a post-it so that you know you're going to remember it for the next meeting and to go like oh I really enjoyed this section because or I didn't expect this to happen because um, and uh, and some of them uh, really take to that, you know, the idea that they can, um, I let them put little pencil marks or underline things on the book itself, or they can put little post-its in or the little page markers are great. Um, you can get, you know, quite cheaply sort of little packets of fluorescent page markers. They absolutely loved those. Um, so have the little key at the front, colour coding the book as they go. Um, interesting bits, difficult bits, unexpected bits, whatever it was. Um, that they were sticking the little post-its in as they go and as I say uh, sort of said about the the setting their own schedule when they're also setting their own topics for discussion and their own questions and um, and they're kind of responsible for that reading in between uh, meeting it really does um, 
quite wonderful things for their motivation as well. Um, so I put these couple of pages in. So this this time round, actually, with um, with year seven, I haven't always done it this way. Um, I put together a little booklet. I say I put together. I found most of it on um, I can't remember where Tez or something similar uh, that somebody else had already done. Um, and put together a little booklet for them with several tasks to kind of work through a to help um, direct their reading outside the classroom. But B, it also meant if I had groups that were really struggling to get discussion going, they had something that they could do and then talk about. So this one on the left, the illustration kind of asked them to um, to look at uh, to illustrate an, a, a, an important event from the from the text. And then to kind of explain to the group why they'd chosen it, what their picture was showing, why they thought that this event was important. And um, so again, it just gave those groups that might have needed a bit of extra prompting, um, kind of something to uh, to discuss. And it also gives them a, a central place to kind of make their notes, keep everything together. Um, so they have their um, their membership grids with their sort of little topics of conversation. They have that in this booklet as well. Um, and some of them kept sort of glossaries in it as they were reading, depending on the text they were reading. Um, so this group that did I Am Malala, um, they used their glossary quite a lot because there was a lot of vocabulary in there that they weren't sure about and they had to go away and find out. Um, the, the other thing I would say about um, using something like this, like a booklet, is um, ultimately, and the reason I put evidence in the scary quotation marks, um, is because if you're thinking about that reading certificate and you're thinking about that you know, activity that the pupil has done to show their reading of the text or the, the presentation, written work, whatever it is, this is that evidence. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, when we got to the end of this cycle, of literature circles and they all had these booklets that they'd done pictures in made notes in then they don't need to do a big presentation at the end of the at the end of the book they don't need to do a big um you know written essay or book review because this is their response to the book and it's kind of happened as they're going along um which also again i think helps with that kind of motivation because sometimes i feel like my, one of my biggest fears i suppose is something like the reading certificate is that as soon as you say right you're going to have to do something afterwards to prove that you've read the book and um, that it's you can instantly hear the, the groan um so doing it something like this where they are literally doing that work as they go um again means they've not got that kind of big thing to do at the end that might feel quite daunting um for some of them so I thought it would be um, would be helpful as a teacher that's kind of now done a couple of cycles of literature circles. Um, I'm focusing really on this evaluation of how it went just on my last one that I did with year seven, because as I said, it's the first time they've done it. Um, and they haven't actually we haven't really done them for for a while. Anyway, I haven't done them for a while because um, of covid and it like lockdowns was difficult to kind of obviously introduce anything that would be very new <laughs> um so the uh things that went well with this kind of first um first go at it with this year group and um, they really loved the book pass at the beginning they loved reading little um two minute snippets of things it's very rare i think um when you have year seven for say two three hours a week it's very rare to have those opportunities or certainly as many opportunities as we would like um to find out what they really love and what they don't about reading so the great thing about this is that they're open to having that discussion because they're dipping into bits and you know they can say well i really didn't like this because or i found this the wording of this actually really difficult because it actually drew my attention to one particular pupil who just said they really struggled with the size of the words on the you know that was a big thing for them as they were deciding what to read 
was actually the the physical layout of the pages in the book um so it's a really good opportunity for you to have those discussions with your pupils as well um, the immediate ownership was a massive, um, massive thing for this group. They're not always the easiest group to get motivated, but that because they felt straight away that was them leading it, they decided who who was reading what, by how long and how often, and it really fostered their independence and they felt that real kind of engagement with the process. It is amazing as well how seriously they take those deadlines. So one of the things we did quite early was they came up with um, what should happen to pupils that don't meet their reading deadlines. Um, and of course, they kind of ranged from the sublime to the ridiculous, but they all were very keen to set some ground rules in terms of, you know, should you be able to be a part of the discussion if you haven't read the book? Well, and a lot of the groups said, well, no, you should be able to go and then sit um, and uh, and catch up with your reading and then um, kind of have to catch up with if we've done an activity together, you need to catch up with that in your own time. You know, they they really came up with some very sensible suggestions um, about what should happen to those that don't uh, read what they've supposed to have read. It didn't happen very often, fortunately. Uh, they developed a really great appreciation, actually, of what makes an effective or often ineffective discussion. Um, so they started looking out for the triggers um, that leads them to getting off topic. They started looking out for um, distractions uh, that happen within a group um, discussion. They started to even figure out kind of what um, help makes them lose their train of thought or what makes discussing an issue with somebody more difficult. And um, so for kind of developing their understanding of talking um, as a means to learn, uh, it was really useful from that point of view. And the supportive mentality they developed as a group was really lovely to see. So I had a couple um, of pupils, dyslexic pupils, actually, who were really struggling to keep up with the speed of the reading, you know, who were just not getting through um, what they needed to get through. They sat down as a group and they came up with a solution together. So one of them uh, searched on YouTube and they found an audio book version, um, which definitely probably is a bit illegal to put audio books on them. Um, on YouTube, but they're definitely on there. I think from COVID as well, there's a massive surge of just teachers reading books out on YouTube, which is great. Um, so that was brilliant because they then said, um, oh, I found this really good audio book on YouTube. Like, why don't you use that as well? That's really helped me. And, you know, they actually came up with solutions together to help each other um, keep up with that reading and and make that burden easier to um, to, to carry between between lessons, so that was great. Um, and of course, the bit that everybody probably wants to hear <laughs> is what went wrong, what could go better next time. Um, it's hard, you know, the first time doing it, of course, there is going to be off task behavior, of course, that when they get into their groups, you are going to have some groups that veer off task much more quickly than others. Um, and kind of when and helping them to recognize that themselves and steer themselves in the right direction um, is definitely one of those things that will get better and better with practice. Um, one of the difficulties can be just keeping your groups kind of roughly in line with one another, particularly if you're doing mini lessons to introduce something as well. So if you wanted all of them to do um, a discussion about the main character, analysis of the main character or something like that, and you had a bit of 15 minute input at the start, right, we're all going to look at our main character. Obviously, um, some groups might find that really easy. Others, depending on their book, even perhaps might find that very difficult. Um, so kind of helping those, um, those children or those groups that struggle to keep the discussion going or struggle to have enough to say, um, I would say that's where the booklets did come in handy because there was always a little task in there that they could do independently and then come back together as a group to kind of discuss what they'd done. So um, that did help on that on that front. And the other thing is um, time. So obviously, <laughs> Uh, with the rest of the curriculum and sometimes you know trying to so I did poetry alongside this 
Um, so they had a lesson, as I say, about half a lesson a week, so about half hour a week to meet with their groups. But the other the other English um, curriculum time, we were doing poetry. And inevitably, uh, you know, they're very busy and there's things that take away lesson time. Um, and always the literature circle was the first thing to go. So I'd be saying to them, no, we, sorry, guys, we're going to have to miss our group. You're going to have to miss your literature circle this week because we've just got to get through this. and We've just got to get through this. And I think that's, you know, something that I've got to get better at um, in terms of treating that time as just as sacred as any other sort of curriculum uh, time as well, which, again, comes with practice for me. <laughs> Uh, so just um, a kind of rounding off now, but um, top tips if you want to give it a go. Uh, first of all, just have a go. Honestly, uh, like I was a bit nervous about starting it for the first time because the idea of relinquishing any kind of control over what goes on uh, in the classroom can be mildly um, worrying. Uh, but, it, you know, it, you, you're not going to get it perfect the first time. And there are going to be teething problems, even having now done, I think, three uh, different cycles of literature circles. I definitely haven't got it right. I come away every time thinking, oh, I could have done that better. I could have scheduled that better, etc. So um, I think it's important to remember that you're not losing curriculum time where you could be focused on something else because all of the skills they develop through discussing those texts and you giving them the time to do that are skills that they will use again and again and again. So they are not, it's not that you're missing the teaching of skills, it's that you're approaching it in a different way. Um, if something isn't working, if you're really worried about the amount of off-topic chatter going on, or if you're really worried about the, um, that more than, you know, more than uh, say half the class are just not keeping up with the reading, then that's the time to kind of bring it back together, like bring it together as a whole class. What can we do about this? You know, I'm worried that this is happening. This is happening. Um, what can we do? What solutions can we put in place to, um, to to make that better? So, again, keep the focus on the students. Keep it very much led by them in terms of coming up with possible solutions. Um, another technique that's worked really well is to use modelling. So even for those kind of non-Englishy topic discussions at the beginning, um, I've sometimes had uh, one group that are doing it really well, sit in the middle of the room, the other sit around the outside and they just listen in to their conversation and actually just using that modelling to what does listening look like? What does note taking look like? Um, you know, what does being kind and respectful to your group look like? Those sorts of things um, have been really useful. Um, and then the little mini lessons, I think things like annotating a section preparing notes or questions on a section and um, we definitely cannot make the assumption that 11 year olds know how to do that on their own um, if you just send them away with the book and say right read so you've decided in your groups you're reading up to page 50 off you go get on with it uh, come back with your ideas they are not going to come back with you know detailed notes or annotations or questions and um, they definitely that's something they have to be taught and um, it's great with the literature circles that you can kind of drip feed that in a bit. So just a 15 or 20 minute input um, before they meet as a, as a book group, just talking to them about how to annotate a text, how to prepare um, a, a section for next lesson, things like that um, is actually do explicitly teach those skills. Um, so before we move on to questions, I think this is probably my last slide. Uh, before we move on to questions, um, just a few other strategies to get you thinking um, about how to kind of build that um, excitement around uh, an engagement around um, the reading certificate. Um, so first chapter Fridays, I suppose, is a, a slight alternative to the book pass. Basically, um, chuck the kids in the library, get loads of books out, just dip, like, uh, dip into it, um, the first chapters of all of them, see what you think. But also, um, that might be just at the end of your lesson on a Friday, you read them the first chapter of a book. Um, and that, you know, lots of children uh, in seven and eight, certainly mine, just still love being read to. Um, so just being, um, just kind of picking a different book each week and reading them the first chapter and talking maybe a little bit about why you've chosen it, what you like about it, um, 
is uh, is definitely um, something to bring up engagement. Um, library lessons, theme displays in the library, um, or you know, use your school library and your school librarians as much as you can. Um, reading cafe. Uh, so again, that might be something a lot of you already are doing already. Um, just it can be pupil led or it could be librarian led, however you do it. Um, but again, get the you know library set up like a little cafe and have piles of books on there and they can just come. So you almost have like a taster menu, um, you know, and sort of you could even theme it with different different cuisines and all sorts. Um, so that's, um, you know, an opportunity just again, a different way of doing the, the book pass for them to just come and dip into a few different things, have a taste, have a try. Um, but it works nicely as a cafe theme because you can have some tablecloths on and some nice music playing, all that kind of thing works very nicely. Um, competitions, challenges, national schemes, you know, anything that's run externally that you can get them involved in is great because they just have that extra bit of enthusiasm about it. Um, I put a little point in there about uh, linking the reading certificate to accelerated reader, um, which some of you may have in your schools or any other programs you're already doing. Um, you know, don't try to reinvent the wheel. As I've said right at the beginning, this shouldn't have to be kind of a, an awkward add on. It should be a way to encourage and support and celebrate all the reading that your children are already doing. Um, so I think the um, yeah, so with Accelerated Reader, obviously, if you do have that program and um, the pupils can do a quiz at the end of the book, they can print off their quiz report to say that they've passed it. And, and that might be their evidence for, for the fact that they have read and, and understood that that book. Um, so, you know, use the tools that you already have in school. Um, so this kind of leads us on to our questions a little bit really um, because one of the things that um, I'd sort of you know we'd really love to hear from English teachers about is where the reading certificate might develop in the future is something that very much is because it's in its infancy can very much still be um, seen as in development so um, Julia and I have had discussions about um, digital versions of the um, the sheet to kind of record what they what they've done and um, perhaps even then something that could be could be shared um, digitally with senior schools as well. Um, we have also discussed the possibility of introducing those grids um, with different headings for year six, year seven. If people, um, if schools are interested in kind of looking at it as a progression, um, and there have been so many questions about book lists, so I actually won't touch on that now. I will cover that when we go to questions because there's been quite a few questions um, about book lists which we'll dive into so I think that's me talking at you and we'll go to um, some questions. Thanks so much Flora as ever that was brilliant hey we've got so many people interact the English teachers are always the best of course I say that but um interacting so I'm just going to start going through um questions and comments that we've had from people loads of fab engagement and actually ideas coming out from the teachers themselves here um Alison Harridge has said that she's got the Daniels book as well um and that learning to negotiate texts as a group is really a skill um and I think you've given us loads of text techniques for being able to address that. Um, Chris Peavy has said, how realistic do you find the children are after only looking at a book for two minutes? I assume you've been training not to just go, it's boring. And Alison's come back and said, she usually just says only boring people are bored and, and kids who are bored are not in the right text. But what are, what are your thoughts on, on what Chris has found? You know, sometimes they just pick the book up and go, oh no, I don't want to. How do you deal with it? Yeah, it is. It's a really, um, it's a really good question because, and I'm sure um, I can't actually see the chat at the moment. I was trying to get onto it a minute ago, see the um, YouTube comments, as I should say. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's a really. I'm sure lots of people will have suggestions as to how they deal with it. I think um, it does take some training. You're inevitably always going to get some. I think if you've got the majority of the group on side those ones that kind of go it's boring very quickly realize actually well everybody else is giving it a go so I may as well do it as well um but I think the other thing that's really key is just in that first book passing um lesson 
is to have as much variety as possible. So I made sure I had um, some sort of, I had a couple of graphic novels even. I had some poetry, um, like, what's it called? The Where it's a novel, but it's written as poems. Verse, prose, verse, fiction, something like that. Um, so I had some of those um, that were really great for the more reluctant readers. They kind of love being it because they can read quite a lot in such a short time. I had some non-fiction, I had some prose fiction. So having as big a variety as possible, again, you're going to be more likely to find that finally pick something up and go, oh, actually, I quite like this one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Millie Potter has said, do they all then read the same book and compare notes or choose different ones to discuss? So in my last literature circle with Year 7, there were as i said it was a class of 12 so i had three groups of four and each group was reading something different so um i had one group reading uh of mice and men which there has funnily enough been a question about which i'll come to in a bit um one group reading curious incident of the dog in the night time which i think has also been mentioned in the question uh and one group reading i am malala so all very different, yeah. but the tasks that they worked through in their booklet and the kind of quest discussion questions we built as a group were um, sort of applicable to any any text. Um, and it's great because then, you know, if you've got them doing three different books, word starts to get out, oh, you'd really like our book. Like it's yeah. really good, you know, and it means that, again, they're kind of without even knowing it, uh, recommending each other's next books and things which is really exciting well that's lovely um and now actually as Anna was um writing this question I think you'd addressed it but we will make sure that Anna's got the answer that she needs she's Anna Hughes has said how does this fit alongside their other independent reading um do you find any children who want more time to read their own books yeah it is it is a good question I would say to be honest uh, generally speaking, I haven't had that issue um, because the kids that are so keen that they want to read their own book as well will do that alongside anyway. Mm -hmm. And the ones that I struggle to get reading anything independently, this gives them a reason to be reading independently. So it kind of ticks the boxes for both camps, if you like. Yeah, I mean, Alison Harridge has actually said it's protected time to talk about text. Um, book clubs are little snippets. They can read independent text at their own pace. Um, book clubs are set by the group. It, I mean, it sounds to me very much from the input that Alison's giving that she, you know, she's had lots of success with, with book clubs and literature circles. Millie's asked another really good question. Um, what happens when they arrive at the next section with pages, um, sorry, next session, uh, with the pages unread and nothing to talk about? <laughs> Um, I imagine that being yeah, right. and it did like and it did happen, and it does happen, and I'm sure it will continue to happen. Um, so first of all, I don't like I don't think I had a single group where all of them showed up having not read what they were supposed to. There were always at least two out of the four that had done it. So they kind of took the lead in fully shaming the ones <laughs> that hadn't done the reading. So I could just step back because they were going to, you know, you've let the group that, you know, that any opportunity to be the teacher. Oh, yeah. um, so they, that was great because they really did hold each other accountable. Um, secondly, they tended then, if there were a couple of them that had just really struggled, they tended to use that half hour to go and sit somewhere quiet and cozy and get the reading done because rather than kind of punish them for not having done it, um, I'd rather that they then get the time to do it so they come to the next one having been, you know, prepared. Um, and they obviously would much rather spend that half hour sitting with their mates and talking about what they've read than they would sitting in a corner by themselves in silence reading. So they only tended to do it once um, before they were like, oh, actually, I would have much rather been sat having a chat about it. Um, and so would come the next time having done the reading. So but it's trial and error, I think, as well. I mean, there's some there's some more good suggestions here from Alison Harridge. I love this comment. About four to five students per club. Six is a party. So she's clearly has, do you know what? And I can imagine that. Um, but she yeah. says they, they can't meet if they don't read to a required page. Yeah. That. And then absolutely agreed with you. 
peer pressure works great here. And um, the other thing I would say that's worked really well for me, I'm just going to show, I'm going to try and show you because I did allude to it earlier, my um, sort of cosy, little cosy reading corner there, um, where I've got my little sofa and, uh, and so basically the group that had worked the hardest in their discussion and had the most fruitful discussion and had all come to the reading the next session they got to sit on the sofa mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was a very good motivator for some of them so, so i had the first couple of weeks i think it was the same group on the sofa twice in a row so then the next time mm -hmm. another group really really wanted that sofa even though it was just for half an hour but that's on the sofa a in a lesson well yeah and it's it looked very cosy. <laughs> so Millie's, and there's a lovely question from Millie, and something tells me that she's making a concerted bid for this post uh, in her department. She'd love some input on how a part-time librarian can support this in the curriculum. That's a really cool idea. Kind of get get more of the school resources, uh, you know, involved in this brilliant idea. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, I, I, we always, every single, um, I think every session we get questions obviously about book lists as well and will IFEB be sharing book lists and um, your school librarian honestly is such a better source for book lists than I will ever be. Um, like school librarians are gods among us as far as I'm concerned because their knowledge of what's out, what's current, what children are enjoying, what's, you know, that will be infinite um so definitely get your school librarians involved and um, so the using the headings is is a really good starting point because actually kind of themed displays of detective fiction or a theme display of um non-fiction that's about a contemporary issue you know using those headings as, as little displays with what what's new into the library in detective fiction or um Things like the classics, I think the classic is a really difficult one on that list because I think there's that be a big turn off for a lot of children is seeing the word classic. Um, so I think even just drawing their attention to classics they might not have thought of or classics where you've seen the film, now try the book, you know, those sorts of displays. And um, actually the librarian is going to be your absolute best friend with them, um, with things like that. So definitely can be really supportive. Yeah, absolutely. Now, actually, some some of the questions I've got some that people sent in beforehand and we, we'll just go to those now. Well, anyone else that wants to, to come in on that chat and, and either comment or ask for a question. But um, we always get asked this about reading lists. Now, um, as an exam board, we know we'd like to think we're trusted but we know that if we released a reading list there there might be a, a danger that people think crikey you know if, if as long as we cover these things we're definitely going to do brilliantly um in the exam and what we don't want to do actually is accidentally stifle creativity or end up um canonicizing a, a range of text unwittingly that said we know how engaged everybody is and we think that there are no finer people to get really excited about books and English teachers. Now, as I alluded to at the beginning, we are just for the first time getting ISCB onto social media. We've got the fantastic Sophie backstage who is brimming with ideas about how we can use this to, to engage people. And Flora and I have talked a lot about wanting to start to create groups, sort of little communities of practice for, for teachers out there. So what we, we've said that we would do is, is over time and around World Book Day, we want to start running campaigns where we are sort of crowdsourcing a, a, a book list. And so what we will start doing Doing into next year is perhaps approaching authors for um, for talking about their favourite texts for children. Approaching, you know, English teachers. I mean, you guys are the best. Uh, English teachers recommend the best books that that pupils have engaged with at year seven and eight, so that we can give you lists. But what we're not doing is, you know, when an exam board re releases a book list or a recommended text list it tends to get done to death and and we want to keep those lists vibrant so we want to find a, a really creative way to give you what you want um i've just had something come in from anna hughes here who says we haven't been gearing towards the reading certificate this year but still hope our current year seven going into year eight will be able to get it can they respond to or use text they've read in year seven i mean i'm gonna yeah yeah absolutely. definitely definitely yeah, yeah. Um, I think 
mine are the same although we've done um they've obviously done their literature circle this last term um and they will have read a couple of other things that they might want to use um but yes absolutely they can use things um that they've read in year seven um i think that's kind of uh obviously if you're going back to say can they do something they've read in year four then probably not because the actual level of the text won't be appropriate for their age but year seven definitely yeah yeah now i've got it's, it's a really long question but it's it's absolutely brilliant and and sophie sent this over earlier we both said oh this is a lovely meaty question so i'm going to break it down into chunks um which books again it's about recommending books however there's a really interesting angle on it there are problems with a lot of the books we might traditionally choose as well as the more modern books suggested e.g of mice and men features the n-word in quite ugly and overtly racist scenes how might you handle that in a classroom with years sevens and year eights? Maggot Moon has F bombs, I love that phrase, has F bombs which could be complained about by a parent, as does the curious incident and others. How might you handle that in class settings? So, why don't we talk about, you know, um, dealing with issues where a text that you have because of its age, um, uh, because perhaps of some of the context of where it's written, has you know, as they say, sort of overtly racist scenes and language that is absolutely unacceptable for mm -hmm. use of today. Um, how, how would we deal with that kind of incendiary language? Um, so, yeah, I really loved this question when it came in because I think it is one of those things that's become um, such a concern over the last few years. Um, lots of schools obviously making big waves in terms of updating their curriculum and throwing out books and getting new books in and you know trying to diversify their class readers and things like that um i suppose a couple of things first of all i never shy away from swearing <laughs> um because i mean number one in my experience nothing gets a 12 year old interested in a book like the fact that it might have a couple of swear words in um secondly as provided the actual content of the book is not unsuitable you know so curious incident is a perfect example um there's nothing in the content of that book really that is unsuitable to discuss for the older year seven and year uh, and year eight pupils um and we have really good discussions about the swearing in terms of the fact that christopher himself never swears he only reports that adults swear so why do we think it's written in that way to, you know, to how does that convey kind of Christopher's experience in his life? What impression does it give us of dad that he swears in this way? You know, and they, um, you know, they ultimately they're not words they haven't heard before and giving them the space to discuss it and like adults in context, um, I think is really, really important. So I certainly never shy away from swearing um, as long as the, everything else about that book, you know, that content wise is appropriate for the age group. Um, what I would do, certainly, if, if, if you're concerned, is just send a letter to parents beforehand or email parents beforehand. I've done that multiple times with books. I've done it actually with Mice and Men um, to say that, you know, we are looking at, in fact, it was previously of when I used extracts from it, um, but that we are looking at extracts from of Mice and Men. It does have language that I understand is completely inappropriate. I actually did tell parents on the extract I was giving them that word would be censored like it's one of the few words that I did not feel comfortable typing up into something that the children were going to have um and uh but I said that you know obviously we're going to very much be looking at this not only in the context in which it was written um but also you know how it's been understood since and how we understand it now and um and parents were absolutely on board with it you know um I think if that those lines of communication are kept open um they they tend to be very supportive. Um, same with, um, actually, I've even done it with something like the woman in black I've done with year eight. And I've, I've done in the, uh, a letter home, but more on a, it's quite scary. <laughs> and if your child is of a nervous disposition, please don't let them read it at bedtime. You know, like there's sorts of things like that. But just keeping those lines of communication open, I find is the easiest way to overcome that because, um, yeah, I think generally, as long as parents have it placed in context, if anything, they'll be going, oh, I wish I'd done that when I was at school. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's definitely kind of one of my my biggest tips, I suppose. Yeah, one of the ways that, that we've handled things before and actually we, we might start to do as, as we get into um, 
working more with teachers and taking their suggestions on is we've actually said that whilst we don't condone um, some of the subject matter that arises, what we do welcome is the ability to to encourage discussion about those contexts. And what I think is quite lovely is that it means that, you know, particularly around swearing, I think whether or not children swear themselves, they may well have been exposed to that language before. Um, and, and as a result, something that can be quite powerful is to be able to explain to them why why we don't and in what context we can't and actually curious incidents are a really good example of that is because it's not the child swearing it's the adult so so and, and do you know what children love the opportunity to talk about what hypocrites adults can be <laughs> my kids love that yeah. um and so i think there's 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 a lot of good discussion there um there is i'm just going to um carry on because that question goes goes into a little bit more um the hate you give orange boy they have plots that very quickly hit on themes that are adult often ugly uncomfortable so they don't seem suitable or, or appropriate for year eight and certainly year seven now this is a really interesting one um the last ce paper had a really intriguing passage on an alien falling in love with earth and deciding to stay and so actually sort of inspired by that passage the, the teacher here had read the book uh, and they say buying the book and reading it i found it hit on themes that are too advanced for year seven uh -huh. to so it wouldn't be suitable and again ask ask for some recommendations on books and and i think what i'm what i'm hearing a lot from um those writing in at the moment is that actually the suggestion for book lists might not be to hang on them but just to ensure that um there's a pool of books where they're not constantly stumbling upon sort of contentious issues that might need you know all of that extra administration uh -huh. around contacting parents uh -huh. the additional contextual lessons um yeah 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 and i think that's you know perfectly valid um concern that of course you want a bank of books as well that um are just you know, great stories to read and don't have all this hefty contemporary issue stuff behind it as well um i think as well you know i've mentioned a couple of them before but things like the carnegie medal and all of those sorts of um you know national book awards um are such good ground um, for um for getting hold of book lists without having to to scour through yourself you know and there's usually most of them will have nice clear sort of age rating give a sort of appropriate age groups um for those texts the other thing as well i'd say because i know exactly the passage that this person was asking about because it came from uh the matt haig uh humans book which is obviously written for adults it's not um it's not a young people's book and um, i think the issue that we obviously have when setting the english papers is that we want the playing field to be level and we want those texts that the children see in the in the exams to be genuinely unseen um so yes it's definitely the case that some of those extracts are taken from books that might be for adults so that passage itself kind of out of context is absolutely appropriate for the for the age group um and that's really as much as anything because it's really difficult to find text that we can sort of go well nobody will have read that in their english lessons in year eight or seen an extract from that so it's more really um those kind of uh, the extracts used in the papers um are as much as anything about finding things hopefully that children haven't already seen Mm, there's a really good um there's another question on this from anna hughes he, she just says might not be time for this but does anyone else have trouble fitting in enough class readers in year eight as they get ready for ce and william dixon has said he agrees but come up with quite a good suggestion that uh, that they rely on short novels yeah absolutely yeah it's a real struggle basically once we've done a class reader in the autumn term and um, to try and get through another one is is nigh on impossible i find with the year eight um, I always tend to do poetry, um, a sort of poetry scheme, so poetry from other cultures or, um, you know, a little bit of a mixture, sort of short stories and poetry together and kind of um, do it from that point of view. Um, it's also perhaps a good place to do um, if you're looking at putting in a modern play into your English curriculums because of the new drama component. 
Um, like that's what I'm planning to do actually with the current year sevens in year eight next year. I haven't decided on the play yet, but um, we'll pick a modern play to do with them in the spring term that's actually going to be a bit less text heavy and um, not necessarily going to kill us if we miss a scene or two. You know, we can we can still pick up the narrative and, and study it as a whole text, um, but uh, but hopefully without so much pressure of of getting through it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's really hard. I know William Dixon uh, uh, does the same as you. Actually, autumn term novel, spring term play script. So, so you're uh, you're in good company there. Um, what I've also done for everybody is um, just put for a suggestion of looking at the Carnegie Medal lists and and just the website there if it's useful to anyone at all. And Anna Hughes has come up with a brilliant suggestion, which is that Common Sense Media has a really helpful at a glance guidance on content so that's yeah. that's another great suggestion there. yeah absolutely there's one called uh book trust as well um uh, does a very similar thing yeah so it has it's also great for parents parents really love the common sense media thing if they're if um there's a book that your one of your children's expressed an interest in and you're a bit like oh don't know whether your parents are going to like that i always ping them an email with the link to it on common sense media and say have a read through this this is the book they want to read because um, obviously sometimes I haven't read it, so I don't know how suitable it's going to be. So tend to ping them that website as a as a bit of a guide. It is really helpful. Um, I'm just sticking this in the chat for a recommends. Um, sending Common Sense Media, yes. Common Sense Media, yeah. And then Book Trust, I think, is the other one that tends to have, um, with each title, we'll have like interest age, reading age. Um, the Common Sense Media one, I think, is the one that has uh that parents say it should be aimed at 12 plus children say it should be aimed at whatever age group the children's one by the way is almost always younger by a good year or two yeah um so i'm just putting um uh these things in anna hughes has said thank you so much for all of this she needs to go to parents evening oh my goodness good luck <laughs> Says it's been fantastic and thank you again um i'm just going to put support you in communicating with parents so i've just put that last comment into the chat for everybody um thank you so much to all of you anna off you go to parents evening super important um and to all of you that have contributed i know i'm biased but i have to say the english session is always the most interactive and the most supportive um and and we absolutely take on board you know we've we've done a couple of i think flora and i are on our third session of doing these together it's super yeah. fun and every time we're being asked about book lists what I, what i think we'll do is we'll try and find some really unique and interesting ways to give you not what we think is a curriculum ideal but yeah. a whole range of ideas i think what i'm hearing from teachers is that um they just want to talk to others and find out what's worked for them and yeah. And what better way to learn them than from each other? So, yeah. Flora, thank you again. Another fab, engaging, exciting session. And to everybody that's joined us, contributed, and, and whether you've contributed or not, thank you so much for coming. We will be running more of these. I haven't run this past Flora yet. We will be running more of these <laughs> next year. Um, if you have any ideas, if you have any ideas, Flora had also asked for, for input on how you might want us to develop that reading certificate. We are a company that really wants to listen and do the things that are going to help you bring English to life and bring all our subjects to life for your pupils. So please do get in touch. Uh, we're at inquiries at isceb.co.uk if you want to drop us a line and we would love to hear from you. So all that remains is for me to thank you all so much and Flora once again and we will see you in the new school year. You must have a break first though everybody. <laughs> so we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>